Great. Well, we're going to get started with the first of our collaboration sessions. So I'm really excited to introduce to you Italo Vignoli. Okay. So the idea is that uh, I will tell you my position on the topic. Uh, I'm, uh, I believe I'm a user. And uh, I believe that in this room there are only developers and lawyers and no users. So this is, uh, so who am I? I have a degree in humanities. I got the degree in 78 when, uh, so it was typewritten. My thesis was typewritten. I've always been involved in marketing. Uh, I hate Outlook. And the reason why I am in open source is that I hate Outlook. So, uh, because I was trying to find a, a software that allowed me to not to use Outlook. So I uh, just basically trashed Microsoft Office and started using OpenOffice and uh, Eudora at the time and then Thunderbird. And believe me, uh, I cannot use Outlook really. It burns my, my brain. Uh, since 2004 in the open office, actually using open office since 2002, into, since 2004 in the, in the community. And uh, uh, I, uh, I entered the community saying, uh, I'm a marketer, I can help you in doing something. And the answer was, marketers are completely useless in uh, free software. So you are basically useless, but if you understand and know English, you can do some translations. And I said, okay, I can do translation, but I think I can do better if I do marketing. And uh, so I, I think we demonstrated with OpenOffice and with LibreOffice that marketing can work. In 2010, I was one of the group of people that uh, launched uh, LibreOffice and actually uh, this is the tenth, as you see from my, this is the tenth anniversary of LibreOffice. And uh, I'm uh, in the PR industry, I'm still a member of the PR association in Italy, I'm still a, I'm considered a geek. So they say, oh, you understand technology perfectly. And developers consider me an idiot in technology. So I basically don't know who I am. And uh, this is how, you know, my, my main issues. I, so the first number, we, user starts counting from one, <laughs> not from zero. And when I said freedom number zero, and I said freedom number zero is it's not. It, for me, zero is no value. So freedom number zero for a normal user is no freedom, no value. Sorry. It, that's, I've talked with many users. And when you say freedom number one, they say, oh, I understand. So freedom number one is the first one is, is, is very impossible. So shift one in terms of numbering if you want to talk with user. Uh, chat, I cannot use I IRC, sorry. I, you know, I start sweating when I use IRC and I do some mistakes, I'm sure. Uh, in a, in a five minutes chat, I can do 10 mistakes in using IRC without any issues. So I telegram, but I use Riot, I use Metric. I need icons. I need icons. Uh, marketing is important for me. Uh, I cannot use the terminal. I have, I, when I present, I say that I have a strange religion. My religion doesn't allow me to use Outlook and the terminal. Uh, they told me, oh, I wrote my thesis with LaTeX. And I said, what? <laughs> uh, that's for geek, not for normal human beings. Uh, and of course, the presentation, they use LaTeX. Prezi, I don't use Prezi, of course. But there is a huge amount of users that use that kind of trash software. And we have to, to educate them to use real software. And then file a bug. And people say, what's a bug? I thought it was a feature. <laughs> OK? Uh, and uh, when, I, when I find a, a bug in LibreOffice, and unfortunately, there are bugs like in any software, the first thing that I do, I talk to another one and said, is this a bug or a feature? Because for me, it could be a feature. But if it's a bug, I will file the bug. And 
now, after so many years, as I'm not completely stupid and I've not lost all, all my neurons, although I'm officially losing them, I've been officially losing them for 43 years as I'm 65. So we start at 22. Uh, I can start to understand, but after 14 years, I can start to understand what's a bug and what's a feature. But it, at first, it was really hard. So, to summarize, and that's my last slide, so then it's up to you to ask questions. You are not idiots with exception, of course. Uh, but there are some users that are normal, normal beings. So they are not idiots. In their profession, they might be uh, extremely uh, knowledgeable, uh, like some lawyers here. But lawyers are not users, are not developers. They, are, they live on a different planet. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they may not be interested in using computers. So, so for them, using a computer is a tool, but they are not willing to invest their time in understanding the tool. And I think that open source has never been friendly to this kind of users that unfortunately are 90% of users. So it's kind of, uh, at the moment, 6.8 billion people in the world. Uh, so, there is a world of people outside FOSS that might be interested in FOSS, uh, but FOSS has not, never, has not been friendly, and I think even if it has progressed in being friendly with users, there's still a lot to do, a lot of ground in terms of uh, really uh, inclusiveness. It's not the question that documentation is missing, it's missing, but it's missing for every software. Uh, the fact is that people should be feel welcome and not like I did. Uh, uh, and I stayed in the in the in the, in, the, um, in open source because uh, I'm a very stubborn person, and I said uh, I'm sure that I can help. But at first, uh, really, the idea is that people wanted to kick me off, and uh, I think that was not nice. And uh, that's all. So if you have questions, of course, debates, tell me that I'm completely wrong. Tell me that lawyers are human beings. That's uh, also something that I would like to understand better, but. Did you want to um, talk about uh, users and their, their standing in free software? The, the way that licenses work right now is uh, only if I am it, let me just focus on copyright for a second. Uh, only if I am using uh, the code uh, under copyright or I hold copyright, more specifically if I hold copyright in software, do I have a right to enforce it? I, I think, are, are you talking about how wouldn't it be nice if users, even though they don't have copyright in the code could have standing in open source software and possibly hardware. We have to educate them. The problem is that a normal user uh, does not understand, that not even think that there is a li license behind software because I'm sure wh when I talk to people about the end user license agreement of Microsoft Office, they tell me, but are you really sure that they signed it? I, I, are you, I've never seen it. I said, of course, because uh, when you saw this, the small screen, uh, you said accept. And, and so you, you read only the first sentence that is uh, Microsoft Corporation. You didn't read the 48 pages that follow and th that are full of clauses that are against you. I say, but this, that's not possible. Microsoft could not do this. There's such a nice company that could never do this kind of stuff. And then uh, I usually send them the PDF of the 48 pages and say, just for your amusement, when you are on a, on a beach, uh, uh, print it and read it. And, and I have people sending me emails saying, well, is that true? Yes, it's true. You've signed it. So either you send uh, a letter stamp that says, I recuse re that, and uh, of course, I never use Word or Office anymore, but you're bound by, 
that license. But the problem is that people do not know that there is licensing, that there are these kind of issues. You know, I think that the, the perception of people in, in open source, uh, which is absolutely right, is that they give for granted that people as a knowledge of software, that the reality is not there. So my wife is uh, the typical 95% user of the world. She hates having a computer, but she knows that she has to, to use one. Well, my wife, just because he's my wife, uh, we are not even Christians, so uh, we, the, 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 the miracle of transubstantiation, which is uh, passing uh, competencies uh, through, the, uh, uh, through, through, through the air, uh, we don't even believe to that. But in the companies where my wife is working, say, come on, with your husband, you must understand this kind of stuff. And now she um, starts to understand that there are licenses, that there, there, there are legal constraints, that there are technical constraints, but it's after being uh, my wife for now 35 years and listening to me talking about technology for all that time. And I can tell you that, although of course it's my wife, but my wife is a smart lady. Is not, and so it, let's say that she's in the top 5% of smart people. You have 95% which is less smart and would never understand that there is a license associated. So I think to, to, to get the users in open source, we should give for granted less things, help them to understand that software is based on licenses, is a, is a, is a, is a, of course, it's a, I'm not, but it's like having a piece of, a, a nice piece of software. It's like uh, having uh, La Gioconda of Leonardo in terms of uh, rights of the author. But no one in the real world will tell you, come on, that's a, that's a masterpiece and a piece of software is a piece of shit, sorry. Uh, because they, in many cases, they suffer from using the software. This is the real issue. And I think, uh, you know, we are too much far away from the normal user. I speak too much, sorry, I know. Questions? So just a slight quibble with your first statement. Developers themselves are usually users in open source because the reason we develop is because we want to use what we've developed. The specific problem is that if it's developed by developers for developers, somebody who's a pure user with no development skills doesn't get a look in in the development process. But the solution for this is supposed to be a business model. So this is a business opportunity for a corporation to make money by bridging the gap between users and developers. Now, I know it's uh, popular to diss Mark Shuttleworth, but his vision for the Unity desktop in Canonical was pretty brilliant. It was basically, I will represent the needs, I will canvas users, do all the stuff, translate all of the impedance mismatches, and employ teams of developers to represent those users' views as code, and we will build something that users want to do. So the problem isn't that you're ever going to get users directly franchised in the developer community. It's just that all of the business models where people have tried to make money doing this seem to be failures. We need to find a way of making this business model successful. Yeah, of course, I was extremistic. I'm a friend of many developers, and I consider developers as human beings. Not <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, but uh, it was just to kind of be provocative and because uh, I think that we really need the, it can be a business model, but in some cases uh, we really have to attract users because uh, it's true that developers are users, but they are users with a heavy technical background, which is a different story. Uh, if you take a user that has not a technical background, so it's not, and there are many that are not enthusiastic about technology. They're enthusiastic about other things, but this is, the, a factor of the of the human being, so they they may love arts and not love technology, but they then they use the computer, and the fact is that uh, 
the proprietary world has been better in some senses in attracting these users, in some cases with heavy tech, uh, ethical issues in, behind it, but the reality is that some proprietary company looks more friendly to users than, than the free open source environment. And uh, I don't like it because I've, and I've been in my life, I've been a consultant to many because I've started doing PR and marketing professionally in 81. So from 81 to 2002, I've been a consultant to most proprietary company. I've worked for Apple for 19 years uh, as a consultant for Adobe. So I, I know very well what these companies are doing, uh, and in some cases they are really more friendly. There is a lot more enthusiasm in attracting users. And we should, of course, find a business model because that is an imperative, I think, uh, to, to sustain the open source environment, but also a way of uh, being uh, more friendly, attracting more people that are around, outside our world. Our world is growing but the world outside is just huge, incredibly huge. There was a question there. Patrick want to hit me from behind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's just a, a little question, really. You said it can be a business model, and I, I find that a little bit worrying, and I may misunderstand. I think there's a lot of confusion around free and open source software, and a lot of it comes from that very statement, it can be a business model. And I think it's something maybe, if you don't mind, we could clarify, because I think what we're saying is that there are business models around open source, but open source or free software of itself is not a business model, right? Or am I misunderstanding? Not sure, the, but the gentleman was talking about the business model that uh, closes the gap between uh, users and uh, uh, and developers and was making uh, unity as the uh, as the example of course business model are, are around the open source and not open source is not a business model but the reality is that we are talking about people that do not even know that there is an open source uh, environment and business model associated so education the education gap is huge and it's, unfortunately, it's an education gap. And uh, in the schools, it's terribly bad because I, I at least I know Italian schools uh, because I'm based in Italy and uh, I talk to, to many in many schools in Italy and university as well. But I think that the situation is similar everywhere. The, the, the fact that in the schools, there's no education at all about the a proper education at all about technology. There is about tools, but that is not about technology. Showing people how to make a presentation doesn't mean that you are teaching him to understand technology. That's the next step. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that we need to get more users involved in actually using um, some of these tools such as LibreOffice or... Not just LibreOffice, open source software. Open. Of course, I, I, I'm a LibreOffice founder and I'm keen about LibreOffice, but don't consider me a, as a representative of LibreOffice in this case, it's just open source. Okay, um, so like in Synology, why, why would you believe that, why, why do you think that in, in schools and government institutions um, and various different types of offices that may be public sector, that we don't actually see operating systems being used um, of a Linux nature and also applications, um, just as an example, LibreOffice or any other one, being used by those particular um, users? Uh, okay, so my personal opinion is that unfortunately today, uh, that, that, there's Patrick there that wants desperately to ask me a question, Richard, so that's, uh, I think that, uh, and this is a personal vision, but, and it's based on my experience. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the political world is driven by lobby in, a, in an increasing way all over the world, not just in Europe, not just in the States. 
If you think that here in Brussels, there are three official lobbyists for each uh, uh, member of the parliament. Uh, that's uh, an imbalance. And uh, they are not working for open source software. They are working for the other world. I cannot see what you're... Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> it's a little bit far away. Uh, so you started off by identifying sort of two communities, the, the, the developer community the, and user community, and they appeared to be individuals, so individuals within those communities. And then are there, so I guess I'm wondering around the messaging that we give and, and the different communities because advocacy for adoption could be specific to those groups or um, often it's seen uh, geared toward um, corporations, governments, as the previous question was, um, and that's a different community. So I guess I'm wondering around messaging and that the messaging that we might use to advocate for adoption among individuals is different than uh, what we would present to uh, governments or businesses. I don't think the average, in my opinion, uh, my friends, families, colleagues, probably aren't going to concerned as much around uh, open source being a, uh, increasing the pace of development or driving innovation or uh, reducing total cost of ownership or all of those other things that we traditionally uh, cite to uh, get adoptions within companies. So f I guess the first question is, is the investment in individual adoption worth doing versus going after large corporations and government? And if those are both equal uh, in what we should be doing, shouldn't we be developing different messages for those different constituencies? Of course, yeah. I mean, the answer is of course yes. The, the, the environment that we have around us is a lot more complex than I depicted, but it was just to simplify the story. Uh, I think that the, the, the basic idea is uh, that we should be more welcoming uh, and more helpful to its external publics to help them uh, in uh, first understand what open source is because I think the big gap is that they don't have a real idea of what open source means and the first question is uh, and this is the, uh, the a question that you get in all Latin countries if it's free it must be buggy uh, or there is a trick behind it uh, and uh, of course we know that it's not the reality but that's unfortunately might be the perception and we have to fight this kind of perceptions and of course then we have politicians and we have lobbyists and we have uh, organization that are complex to t more complex to tackle Hi. Um, so my impression <clears throat> is, and I'm curious if you agree with this, that the public has been starting to uh, to realize uh, all the things they've been agreeing to in these license agreements with a lot of recent news coverage about uh, the large tech companies. I'm wondering if, if you think there's an opportunity there just for us to, um, I, and I don't know how exactly, but to, to uh, take advantage of that and just tell people like, hey, we exist, we're, um, we are, we make all these things that you don't have to agree to all these, um, all these crazy license agreements to, to use. Uh, of course, uh, the more, the more there is debate about around open source, the better it is for, for open source in a sense. But in, on the other hand, uh, uh, some of the debates that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years are not entirely positive because they are representative of a huge friction inside open source that the reality is not probably not there, is a friction of some companies versus open source. At least this is my, my personal opinion. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, but I think we, we should, do, we should do, be, do more outreach ourselves. Uh, and do outreach uh, not being prepared to have people that do not understand at first what we are telling them. And then uh, be patient and start really from the basic, from scratch. 
and uh, show them that uh, there is high professionalism behind open source as there is in behind any other software. But actually, if you look at it in a really good way, there is a lot more professionalism behind open source than behind proprietary software. At least this is my point of view. Uh, I know the time is over, but I, I would like to say one thing. For uh, we, we in Italy, and this is uh, about LibreOffice, but could be about any other open source software. In Italy, we have migrated the Ministry of Defense. So they have 100,000 users, which is not trivial. And uh, we, we told them, uh, uh, we help you in, uh, in, uh, in going through the process. And uh, we, as a kind of nice gesture, we do that for free as volunteers. Uh, but you have to follow our uh, training program. And the training program starts with four hours about open source software which is not about uh, how you use a writer, a calc, or impress, but it's about open source software. And it's usually me uh, doing that. And they said, uh, okay, but we are not interested in the first four hours. And we said, okay, if you don't do the first four hours, you do, we won't do the other 32. Uh, so we started, and I, uh, I started in, in, a, in a pact. Uh, there were over 50 people. Uh, some of them with medals going up from here to there because they wanted to show that they were generals or... Uh, and uh, the, the, the day, the, when they showed up, they, they, they had question mark in their eyes. Like, uh, we know we have to, to, to lose four hours uh, with that stupid idiot uh, old Italian. Uh, and at the end, uh, they, at the end of, the, of the four hours, they, most of them thanked because they, I told them, uh, normal things, but things that they were not even supposing could be behind open source software. Like, like how we do security, how we do development, how we coordinate development. And they thought that all, we, we were all ponytail, uh, working in, you know, in a basement uh, uh, without light uh, at six o'clock in the morning, developing uh, or solving the last bug, which is not really the reality. So I think uh, we have really a task of educating people, and I'm over, and I, t I know that I talk too much. Thank you very much, Intelo.